Hey, South Bay, in this video, we're gonna have a, a couple uh, songs for, uh, for worship that uh, have been done by our worship team a while back, uh, back when we were meeting in the garage. Uh, and then I'll come back with a, a communion lesson and a couple discussion questions you can use, and then one more uh, song to, to reflect on as we take communion together. So thanks for joining us on the live stream today.
Good morning, South Bay Church. Uh, it's great to be with you on the live stream here, and I hope you're having a great house church. Uh, for those of you who aren't yet connected to a small group in the South Bay Church, we would love to connect you with a group. Uh, and if you participate in our services and you're in some other part of the world or other part of the country, uh, we would love to get you connected with one of our local churches um, so you can meet up with people uh, in your own community. We're a part of a family of churches called the International Churches of Christ. and uh, But we love that you uh, participate with us online. Uh, and it's great to be with you. Um, I'm Brian Craig. I've uh, You haven't seen me here on this channel for several months. Uh, my wife and I have been on a ministry sabbatical after uh, 22 and a half years of ministry. It was great to be able to uh, just take a little bit of a breather and... Um, take some time to reflect and rest and uh, spend some deep time with God and then uh, reading and study and just kind of thinking about what uh, where we are in our lives and what the next chapter is going to hold for us. Mostly just stopping. Uh, the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word for stop and I, I've learned so much about how important that is, uh, how it's right built right there into the creation story. But anyway, that's a, a, a lesson for another time. Uh, but the title of the lesson today is Long Time Coming. A uh, long time coming from a, a, a little story we're going to look at in Exodus you've probably heard of, you might have heard of before. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in kind of a weird part of the Bible. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say it's kind of my least favorite part of the Bible because it's just so different culturally. And uh, it's the, the part of the Bible where God's people have come to Mount Sinai. They've come out of slavery in Egypt. I love that part. I love all the old stories of Abraham and, and, and Jacob and 
uh, Joseph and, and uh, you know, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all these great stories in Genesis, uh, the, the real early sort of prehistory stories of uh, Adam and Eve and, and Noah and, and Babel and kind of what all, le- just this, it's just awesome story. And it's moving along, moving along, moving along. And then it's this epic, uh, really identity defining moment for God's people as he uh, really establishes his own name, Yahweh, uh, amongst you know all the other gods of Egypt. He is he is they're they're not real gods, and he is the real creator God. And he defeats the Egyptians, the most powerful nation in the whole world, brings the whole people out of uh, enslavement. It, it's just a I mean it's an epic, crazy story. And then it just all the action just grinds to a halt <laughs> at at Mount Sinai, and it gets really confusing because. You know, in Exodus, the first part of Exodus, we, we all track with. But then when it when he's going up the mountain and down the mountain and up the mountain, and then they, they, they're supposed to go on the mountain, but they're not supposed to go on the mountain. And who can go on the mountain? And and uh, it just gets a little weird and confusing. And then there's just all of this stuff about the tabernacle and, and you know, how to make this curtain and, and the, the altar and incense and... And, and, and these outfits for the priests and, and you know, the all of this, the, this bread they're supposed to leave there all the time and these candles and it goes into a lot of detail about these candles and, and how they're supposed to be an almond bud. And, and anyway, it, it just gets really, you know, from our view, vantage point, it's just like, what is this? This is so weird. And it goes and goes and goes and goes like the second whole half of Exodus uh, Exodus 19 on, and then all of the book of Leviticus, and then kind of the beginning numbers there is just this this part of the Bible that we, we tend to sort of shy away from or just kind of breeze right through or go, Wait, this is weird. So I've been spending some more time there just trying to learn more uh, from, there's a lot of literary stuff there, a lot, a lot of... Uh, uh, you, you know, the stuff that we don't immediately get. And, and the, the guys at the Bible Project, Tim Mackey, uh, is really good at this. He's a, he's kind of an expert in this area. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Bible Project, just just go on YouTube and, and look up Bible Project, and you'll see all kinds of amazing videos. But they have a new app, and they, they go in-depth into some of this uh, stuff. So I've been learning some from there as well as from other sources uh, I'm not going to really get into all of that, but I'm just telling you that's what made me think about this story here today in Exodus. Um, and what happens in Exodus, and let me show you a picture here. So as I've been talking about, the uh, this is a map of, uh, and this is from a great book called Epic of Eden by Sandra Richter that I'm in the middle of right now. It's a really easy read, but it really gives you a great overview of the Old Testament and some of the stuff uh, I'm talking about if you want to uh, dig deeper. But so the, the God's people are in this area, Goshen, and then they leave. But they to, to go to the Promised Land, it would have just taken a few days if they'd gone up this way. But God doesn't want to take them that way because of all these established nations there. Plus, uh, Egypt had some major strongholds there on their way out. And, and so instead, he leads them through the Sea of Reeds. Uh, it's been mistranslated for centuries, this, the Red Sea, but it's the Sea of Reeds. It's this marshy area. He parts that, parts the ocean, parts the sea, parts the marshy uh, area in this miraculous way, leads them out. Anyway, they end up down here at Mount Sinai. So this is where this is for for a long time. And and Moses um, goes up on the mountain to to meet with God. And I want to read you this verse, Exodus 19, 3, to sort of set the stage. It says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So, you know, those of us who who have been um, disciples of Jesus for a long time will will recognize that some of that terminology, uh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We know that in the new covenant, uh, we are called to be that. We are now uh, not a replacement for Israel, but we are grafted in, as uh, uh, as Paul says, we're grafted into this call to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That was never really fulfilled back then, but it's really fulfilled in the kingdom of God now and then in the future uh, in, in amazing ways. So 
uh, this is what the calling is. They're, they're called to have this partnership with God, to be almost in like a, a, a marriage to God, a covenant relationship with God. And, and so uh, that's, the, that's the context. But, but in order to do that, they need to, to, have, they need to establish a, a nation. You know, they've, they've been slaves for hundreds of years, and uh, they've got to build a nation. And so God's going to give them s- some blueprints for that. And so then he goes up in the mountain and Part of the thing that, that's confusing that I learned recently is it, the narrative has him go up and down the mountain seven times. So that's why it gets a little confusing. And then it also has some sort of flashback moments in there. So it's not exactly chronological uh, there in Exodus 19 through 32. And so it can get a little bit confusing. But uh, but we we do know that he, he's up there a while. And in fact, Exodus 18 uh, says that, uh, or Exodus, let me see, which chapter is this? It's verse 18, and I'm not sure which chapter, actually. I think it might be 24. It says, Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So he's there 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, So it's a while. And so that brings us to our text here that we're going to look at today, Exodus 32 in verse 1. Uh, Turn over there in your Bible, if you would, or uh, I will throw the, the scriptures on the screen. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So, you know, 40 days, if you think about it, if you're waiting for your leader uh, to bring you back instructions and, and what's going to happen, that's a, that could be a long time, you know, uh, 40 days, 40 nights. And they start to, they, they, they get impatient. They're tired of waiting. And so they, they tell Aaron, we, we, wanna, we want you to, 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 we want to take matters into our own hands, so to speak. And I'll explain a little bit more what, what was going on there. But in verse 2, it says, Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who's brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So what's happening here is is they are wanting to, it, it seems a little weird to us because it's not our culture, but what they're doing is they're reverting to the worldly culture around them. And even these earring, these gold earrings that they have, if you remember the story, as they were leaving Egypt, uh, Moses told them to ask their neighbors in Egypt for, uh, you know, for gifts. And so the, their neighbors gave them all this gold and, and uh, these gold earrings and stuff that the, the, the people that they were enslaved to gave them these gifts and then they carried them off. It says in that way they plundered Egypt. So they, they, they carried off a lot. Egypt was, like I said, the most powerful, wealthy nation on earth at the time. And they bring a lot of that wealth with them. But now they take that wealth and use it to uh, make an idol um, and to worship an idol. And this calf that they they make, it's it, it's very common in that area uh, of the ancient Near East. Uh, the, you can uh, Google um, ancient Near East calf or bull, and you'll see all kinds of. It was a very common uh, fertility image or um, a, a god like a god image that they would use. And so they're just trying to be like other people. They're trying to be like the world. And they, they want a, a, a God that they can see and that they can control. Um, so he builds this, uh, uh, th- makes this calf, builds this altar. It says in verse 6, The next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. This was a, another cultural thing, the way that you interacted with the gods in their day. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. So sexual uh, immorality and, and just... Uh, partying was even part of worship of, of these pagan gods in, in that time. So it's it's like a, a an orgy. It's like a, a, a really immoral scene that's going on here in addition to being idolatrous. Uh, in verse 7, The Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people who you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and make themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They bowed down to it and sacrificed it and said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. 
that's not the end of the story. Moses intercedes for the people. Uh, God uh, relents and he doesn't destroy the people. Uh, but this is a dark moment. And it's a moment that's repeated again and again in the story. It's the same moment as Adam and Eve, right? Choosing their own path instead of trusting God. It's the same story as Cain choosing his own path and killing Abel. Uh, you know, the, the people at the time of, of, of the flood that were uh, turning to sin instead of uh, to God. And it's it's our own story, you know, and, and I think it, it's interesting the language he says, they have been quick to turn away, this is verse 8, they've been quick to turn away from my, what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol. And, and that is uh, something that applies to you and me. None of us like waiting, right? None of us like the long-term uh, thing that God is often doing to shape our characters. We want quick fixes and we want immediate results, don't we? Uh, we're all, we all hate waiting. You know, that's one of my favorite little short lines from The Princess Bride, uh, where the Spaniard says, I hate waiting. <laughs> you know, he's, I am waiting for Vecini. Uh, sorry, for, forgive me for uh, my accent there. Uh, but I love that. I love that movie. Uh, anyway, we all hate waiting. We all hate it. And, uh, and our culture is one where everyone is in a hurry, right? We've got fast food meals. We've got uh, microwave, it's just a microwave lifestyle of just, we want it now. Um, I was going to bake something the other day, uh, and, uh, you know, the baking time was 45 minutes, and it was like, ah, I moved on <laughs> to something else because I wanted quicker results than 45 minutes. I couldn't even wait 45 minutes. That's just our world that, that we're in. Um, one of the books that I read on sabbatical, which I would really recommend, is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer ruthless elimination of hurry and he's talking about pushing against our culture our culture is so hurried and 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 so filled with anxiety because everybody's um so busy and in such a rush and he uh quotes um a scholar from charleston southern university school of business who conducted uh, a survey of over twenty thousand christians across the globe and here's his what what he comes up with that everyone is even christians everyone's in a hurry he says number one Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which leads to, number two, God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives, which leads to, number three, a deteriorating relationship with God, which leads to, number four, Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live, which leads to, number five, more conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload. And then the cycle begins again. See, I think we, it's easy to look down on these uh, Israelites and go, look, God just brought you out of Egypt. Why are you grumbling? You know, as, as happens before the story. Or why are you so quick to, to, to give up on God? Are you kidding me? You're making a gold idol when, when God, you just saw the plagues of Egypt and, what, and God part the Red the Reed Sea and God do these amazing things. How can you do that? We can, we can look down on them, but I think all of us are them. That we, we all have seen God work in amazing ways, and yet we can be quick to turn away from God's commands or turn away from trusting God and turn to what we can control or turn to the worldliness around us. And that's what they were doing. They were trying to be like the world, and, and we can all do that. Um, one of the things I really learned or have been learning over this time of sabbatical is there's uh, to do just a lot of waiting, a lot of learning to stop, learning to slow down, learning to be still. And uh, it's hard for me because especially at the beginning, it was so hard for me. I'm so used to always be multitasking, always be doing and always be on to the next thing. And and just to stop and just be just just be, you know, uh, focus on being and not doing was so hard for me. And uh, uh you know, but but I, I I was it was affirmed again and again and again that in Scripture the, the, a posture of worship and a posture of uh, of fo being a God follower is a posture of waiting. It's a posture of surrender. It's a posture of uh, of trust and humility uh, and trusting in God's promises and trusting in God's timing, even if it's not my timing. And and what's so hard about that is if your your current situation is frustrating or it's painful. Uh, Dessa is dealing with a, a physical pain right now. She has a frozen, sho frozen shoulder syndrome. Her left shoulder 
And uh, she went through this in 2017, which was a really difficult year for us. She went through this with her right shoulder and, and the whole thing took about a year and a half. And now she's going through it with her left shoulder where it's all, you know, it's it, it, if you don't know about frozen shoulder syndrome, it's something that happens to middle-aged women, about 40% of middle-aged women to some, one degree or another. So some of you listening might have been through this or know someone who has. And it's just, the, the pain is really intense for her. And sometimes it's like there's no letting up. And 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 she's working with doctors and physical therapists and chiropractors and 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 getting lots of input and trying to do what she can. But ultimately, she just has to wait. Uh, that this process just has to work its way through until her shoulder gets back uh, in, in, into use again, and and she's able to have things kind of back to normal. And so it's just frustrating. And it can be like that sometimes in. The Christian walk, uh, where we're just dealing with something, a, a, a situation that's frustrating, and we're stuck, and it's just so hard to wait on God. Um, and, and here's some practical areas of waiting that, that I was thinking of. Um, just our daily walk with God, just daily taking time to stop and be with God. Uh, it, it requires you to stop and wait on Him, wait on His presence, um, going out for a prayer walk or, or sitting still and, and, and talking with God, it requires you to stop and wait. Or reading the scriptures and waiting to see what God has to say to you. Uh, and, 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 and being patient and diligent in that day by day by day, having routines, spiritual routines where you just, you're never going to miss that time with God. Nothing, the busyness of life or all these other things or the desire to rush off and do this or do that, it, it's not going to steal from this time of just stopping and waiting and being with God. Uh, the things that we get anxious about, I mean, Steve talked about this a couple weeks ago uh, in his sermon, just all, all there is to make us anxious or worried or just the world around us and the chaos around us. Uh, and, and, but Jesus tells us to not worry, to not be anxious about anything, to, but, but to, to, to seek first the kingdom and God will take care of our even most basic needs, the things that we can worry about, like food and clothing and shelter and and then so much more that we get anxious about, but choosing to trust, choosing to wait on God uh, for those things. Um, waiting on God, trusting God with, with his laws, his, his rules, or his, his boundaries, or his, his way of doing things. You know, it's, it's different than the world, right? And so it requires us to trust in God when it comes to areas of purity or areas of boundaries or just lifestyle. You know, the lifestyle of being like Jesus is a very different lifestyle. Uh, our, the sexual ethic that we see in scriptures is very different than the sexual ethic that we see in the world. And uh, it can be tempting to go, oh, I just want to take matters into my own hands and and and, and I, I'm just going to do what the world is doing rather than trust in God. Uh, God's plan, trusting in God's plan versus our plan. Even in interpersonal relationships, even within the church, I think sometimes we have to wait. We have to wait on God, or God's way might not seem like it's working in the immediate. Uh, or, or even the way of the cross, the way being like Jesus means you pray for your enemies, you turn the other cheek, you, uh, you know, rather than seizing control, you allow, God, you know, allow God to avenge, allow God to work it out, and you just, as far as it depends on you, you live at peace with everyone, and you try to be like Jesus and. And you, you know, you, you try to not repay wrong for wrong. And, you know, that, that's hard. That, that can be really difficult in relationships to just trust God. God sees, God knows, God's bigger than all this. And again, the way of the cross is a way of trust and waiting on God's redemption. It might not be now, but it will be eventually. God is going to work it out in the end. This will be made right in the end. I want to ask you today, are you tired of waiting? Is there some area that you feel like, um, you know, is really hard for you to wait on God? I want to call you to trust in God's promises. Don't be anxious about what the world is anxious about. Don't allow your, um, you know, your, your desire to not wait anymore to cause you to drift, as Rhett talked about last Sunday. Uh, don't swerve, as the Bible says in, in Hebrews 10. Uh, but but stick with it. Stick with what's right. Don't give up meeting together, as Hebrews 10 says. Don't hold on swervingly to hope we profess. Let's keep one another on the path, uh, even as we are waiting uh, for Jesus. Ultimately, we're waiting for him to come back, aren't we? That's what it even means to be a Christian at this time in human history. Uh, make a decision today to be faithful, to persevere, to trust in God's promises. It is worth it. Uh, it will be worth it, if it, even if it doesn't feel like it right now. In more ways than we could ever imagine, in the end, it's going to be worth it. Heaven will be absolutely worth it. 
uh, even even in ways again like we don't even know. Um, my son Marshall turned 21 this week, and uh, his birthday was on Tuesday, and we decided to. Uh, have a couple of his friends, uh, Alex and Kira, help us to plan a, a surprise birthday party for him and a, a lot of his friends. And, um, you know, we we weren't sure if we'd be able to pull it off because if you know Marshall, he is very, very inquisitive and <laughs> asks questions about everything. And there was all these little times when it was like, oh, no, he's going to figure it out. Oh, no, he's going to figure it out because he would ask about this or ask about that. And But somehow he was prevented from... from uh, from, from catching on and he was surprised. But that day, um, you know, he was feeling a little bit bummed because we were going to go out to a family dinner, but he didn't really set up anything with any of his friends. And he was he was wrestling with just feeling kind of a little like, oh, this is my 21st birthday, but I'm not, I didn't really set anything up and I, I should have done something. But then, tr- and, and you know, and, and, and yeah, people said happy birthday at this meeting I was at, but it just, but then I don't want to feel like selfish. And, you know, he's just wrestling with that stuff. And, you know, how, how it is on some of us on our birthdays, we're more sensitive than others. And and uh, he was just like, oh, I just need to not worry about it. And, and it's fine. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll hang out with people later or whatever. And, and then uh, and then, boom, it was this huge uh, surprise party and this awesome, awesome party that he got to really enjoy that night. And I think sometimes it's like that with God. Like we don't even know what's behind the corner. God is is there's this big surprise that God is orchestrating that's going to come through either in this life or the next life, and and we just have to wait. We just have to wait a little bit longer, and God is going to come through. Uh, I don't I don't know exactly what the afterlife is going to be like, but I think it is going to be like a big party with our best friends. I think it is going to be connection and fellowship and. And, 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 and just being together, delighting in each other and, and, and delighting in the presence of God together. Uh, you know, so I want, as we take communion, I want to remind you that communion is an active act of waiting. It's, it's active waiting. It's participating in this meal together that reminds us that we are waiting. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 26 for, says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, that is what we're doing as we as we take the bread, which is his body, and we take the, the fruit of the vine, which is his blood. We're remembering his body and blood given for us, and we're, 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 we're just being reminded of our waiting posture, that we are like the, the virgins uh, with their oil, waiting for the bridegroom to come back. That's, that's who we are as Christians. And so this life is not going to fully satisfy us. And this world is not going to fully meet all of our needs because there's something in us that longs for what's coming. There's something in us that that looks forward to. And we, we get to delight in different things that give us a taste, a foretaste of those things, but those things are not here yet. And so it's just good to be reminded uh, of why we're here, that we are here to be that holy nation, that kingdom of priests that, that uh, Moses told the people they were to become all the way back there at the foot of Mount Sinai. That is who we are. We are this kingdom of priests and we're waiting on God together. So uh, I have a couple discussion questions I'll throw on the screen here. You can either choose to use these and discuss these with your group or with uh, someone in your household or or, or not, but uh, you can pause the video and, uh, and, and discuss these. And then another kind of practical thing you might do together is read Hebrews 10. Uh, just read it through together uh, with this context in mind that we've just talked about, this idea of waiting. There's all these little bits of Hebrews 10 that are really good and we pull out of context, but it's interesting to read it all together because Hebrews 10 is really about this, about not, not giving up, be persevere. We have confidence to enter the most holy place. Like we can commune with God even now. So don't give up your, he says, don't give up your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Uh, we got to keep going. You need to persevere so that you will receive what he has promised. And so read, read Hebrews 10 together if you have time, if time allows, uh, as you take communion together. Uh, but I'll pray right now uh, for communion and then I'll leave the uh, discussion questions on the screen. God, thank you so much uh, for this time to remember Jesus. And I know in Hebrews 10, it says even now he is waiting, as it says in Hebrews 10, 13. He's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. In other words, he is ruling and reigning, but still all the worldly powers are not yet subject to him. And so the kingdom is coming even as we are praying together and gathering and worshiping. Uh, In in small ways, you are working in the world and and through us to bring the kingdom to those that don't yet know Jesus. And and, uh, Father, help us to be patient. Help us to be patient with 
with his coming. I know even in the time of the Bible, uh, people were getting impatient and, and saying, where is this coming he promised? And yet, God, uh, thank you that uh, you, your timing is not our timing, and you know ju- you brought Jesus to earth at just the right time, the Bible says, and I know at just the right time, he will return. And we don't know when that will be, but Father, we wait patiently. And we pa- wait patiently as well, just on the kind of everyday struggles that we go through and, uh, and, and, and the, the difficulties that we face just in this life. I know Jesus said in this world, we will have trouble, but thank you for the promise that Jesus has overcome the world, and we as well, will overcome the world if we trust in you. Bless this time of communion and this time of fellowship and this time of remembering Jesus together. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm 
for the Lord.